Um, welcome, welcome to the seminar series um, on ethical issues in health reform. Uh, my name is Mark Siegler, and on behalf of the McLean Center, I'm delighted to welcome you back to the first talk of this quarter. Uh, if you haven't noticed, this quarter is the winter quarter in Chicago. Uh, we, we have a rich program coming up uh, for, the, for the quarter. Um, it, it includes Dr. Wang's lead-off talk today. I see Harold Pollack in the back. Harold is going to be speaking next week um, uh, on, on the topic of the Affordable Care Act and disability policy. And we'll have other speakers, Anoop Milani and Nancy Ann DePaul, um, as well as many others. So I'm, I'm delighted to welcome you back. T today's talk is the fourth in our series that is co-sponsored uh, with the Institute of Politics. And we're joined today by Steve Edwards and Darren Reesberg, who along with David Axelrod are, are the senior leaders uh, in the Institute of Politics. Gentlemen, welcome. Uh, now I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Elbert Wang. Uh, Dr. Wang is an associate professor of medicine, the associate director of the Chicago Center for Diabetes Translational Research, uh, and the director of an exciting new center for translational and policy research in chronic diseases. Uh, Dr. Wang received his AB, MD, and MPH degrees from Harvard and came to the University of Chicago in 2001. Dr. Wang studies clinical and policy issues at the intersection of diabetes, aging, and health economics. His main research has focused on medical decision making for elderly patients with type 2 diabetes. And over the past decade, Elbert has established one of the most active research programs in geriatrics diabetes in the country. He's the co-principal investigator of an NIH-sponsored diabetes and aging study. Dr. Wang has received many honors, including the Research Paper of the Year Award from the Society of General Internal Medicine and membership in the Young Turks, the American Society for Clinical Investigation. For one year, Dr. Wang was a senior advisor in the office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation in the Department of Health and Human Services. Today, Dr. Wang will be speaking on the topic, you see it up here, uh, the impact of health reform on the doctor-patient relationship. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Elbert Wang. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you to the um, McLean Center and thank you to the Institute of Politics for uh, inviting me to speak and sponsoring this event. Um, this is an outline of the talk and I'll uh, be fairly faithful to this. I'm going to first lay down a framework for you about what I think determines the quality of the patient-doctor relationship. Um, I'm going to describe what I believe are core variables that uh, affect the quality of the patient-doctor relationship. And then I'm going to take you on a little bit of a journey through healthcare reform, starting with uh, healthcare reform in the 1960s, what people thought was going to happen then to the patient doctor relationship, what they thought was going to happen to doctors and their livelihoods. And then I'll move into a um, more recent form of health reform, the Affordable Care Act, review its major components, and then go down uh, through at least the major components and talk about how they might affect the patient doctor relationship. Um, so, um, you know, laying down this framework, I mean, it boils, it still does boil down to who the patient is and who the doctor is in this relationship. Certainly, uh, the context of how they interact, whether or not they can interact, the nature of the healthcare system, all can affect the patient doctor relationship. But I still think it does matter who the patient is and who the doctor is. And these two players still are very important in the quality of the, the relationship that they have. So patients, um, you know, they come to the relationship with different expectations. Um, they, um, uh, they, they have expectations based on what they've heard. Um, they read publications. They um, may rely on um, 
you know, reviews of doctors and on the internet, they rely on referrals, they depend a lot on um, the reputation of physicians and medical schools, where they went. And so they, they come to the relationship with some expectations. And they may have different desires um, um, about what they want from the relationship. And so this is as variable as there are uh, human beings in terms of what they want personally, what they want from their, uh, uh, what they expect culturally from a patient-doctor relationship. I think it also can't be understated how um, the patient-doctor relationship is affected by the presenting medical problem that the patient has. Um, and, what, and, and, and that definitely affects the relationship. Is it a complex problem that it is really at the edge, at the, that requires the forefront of medicine uh, thinking? Or is it something that um, has an established uh, treatment protocol, an established way of di diagnosis that, um, that most doctors can handle? Um, and depending on the nature of, that relate, of, the, of the presenting problem, uh, the patient has totally different experiences with the medical system, has completely different expectations for what they want, um, and uh, reasonable or, or unreasonable. And of course, the patient um, is affected by the external influence of the health system when they arrive in the, um, in the office to visit with a doctor. Um, and it is amazing uh, to me uh, it, just in my practice uh, over the last decade, how small things, what, what we think are small things that occur to a patient outside of the, the visit affect their, complete, their expectations or ex expect their, affect their experience with the, with the doctor. So literally getting a frown from a desk clerk or having difficulty making an appointment with you um, already alters the nature of the expectation that the patient has and can affect the patient-doctor relationship. Is it, was it difficult to, to get access to you? Was it difficult to get access to information? Um, I have found that um, my patients will bring bills from prior visits where they're still having difficulty paying off the last visit and going through and ex asking, why did you order this test? Why did you order this test? Those costs of, of health care, costs of medications that we prescribe, um, even if we uh, prescribe them with our best intentions, um, can come back to affect and sour the patient-doctor relationship. So that's all from the external influence of the health system. And many of you who have practiced medicine for a long time know that patients disappear from our panels for whatever reason. Um, patients move away, they lose their jobs, they lose their insurance, and that disrupts the nature, of the, the longevity of the relationship that we can have with them. Doctors, I think, um, in many ways, affected patient doctor relationship by simply who they are. A lot of this has to do with who we select into medical schools. Do they have, do the, does the doctor have native empathy? Are they good at communicating? Um, uh, we all know that we select into different medical specialties to some extent based on our personality and what, we, what the kind of experience that we want with patients um, on a regular basis. So you, those of you who are pediatricians, you like to see children bounce back from illness. You like to see the bounce back. For those of us in medicine, we're not afraid as much of the, the long, dragged out uh, you know, um, um, burden of chronic diseases. Um, over time, as we uh, practice medicine more, we acquire long-term experiences with patients. That affects the way that we approach new patients that we encounter, affects the way we approach old patients that we've had for a long time. You'll notice that I've I do think that the quality of decision making and the effectiveness of the physician in terms of expediting the right uh, therapy or the right diagnostic uh, strategy is very important. But you'll notice that I've ranked this lower than I think communication. I think you can actually be an average to not so good medical decision maker, but if you're excellent at communication, your, doc your patients will probably love you. Um, and of course, doctors uh, and their interactions with patients are affected by the external influence of the health system, whether we want to or not. Um, I think many of us choose different, uh, to practice in certain areas because we want to avoid some of these things, but the reality is the, the nature of reimbursement affects um, the pace uh, in which we see patients. Um, Financial incentives are certainly uh, going to become a larger player in terms of how we behave and interact with patients, including pay for performance, pay for quality. Um, and the culture of the clinical setting that we practice in certainly affects, I think, the patient-doctor relationship. 
And this is a, a sort of a, a description of what I believe are the core variables among the external influences that can affect the patient doctor relationship. Uh, the amount of time that we have to interact with patients is a chronic and constant complaint among doctors. We just don't have enough time to deal with the patients that we have. Um, so that the, the length of time during the face-to-face -face encounter is still held, it's still believed by many doctors to be really, really important. And as it shrinks or gets longer, affects the quality of relationships. Whether or not we're able to maintain long-term relations with the patients, as I mentioned earlier, the length of relationships affects the quality of uh, our interactions. Um, I can't, uh, among, um, in this audience, we have a number of experts in health disparities, and those of you who know that language and racial concordance between patient and doctor can also play a, a, a big role in terms of the quality of relationships. And increasingly, um, I, I think, um, uh, we're being pushed, and it's already happening, we're beginning to interact with patients increasingly outside of the traditional face-to-face -face encounter, either through uh, web patient web portals that are now incentivized as part of the High Tech Act. Telephone, of course, is a long, uh, has been a long-standing way of interacting with patients, increasingly using email. And um, in increasingly, we're going to be incentivized to use things like decision aids, which are basically ways of delivering information about medical decisions to patients that involve them in making decisions. And of course, we can't say enough about uh, the, the, you know, the, the title of this talk talks about doctors, but it's definitely more than doctors. Um, our nurses, our nurse practitioners, physician assistants, medical assistants, they're all part of the overall experience between a doctor and a patient. So, I, so those are what I believe are the core variables in terms of the, the nature of the relationship between patients and doctors. It's the patient's expectations, their medical problems, the doctor, their native empathy, their ability to communicate. Um, but there are also, of course, uh, um, uh, external influences. So I'm going to segue a little bit into the 1960s and the 1950s. I, I didn't exist at that time, so I, I can't really speak from any uh, direct personal experience. But uh, you know, perhaps this was the way that medicine occurred before Medicare and Medicaid. I'm not sure. And this, you see that the, the, that uh, uh, the, the patient is paying uh, with a pig and chicken for his care. Um, but uh, there was a time before Medicare and Medicaid, and. Um, would love feedback from any physicians here who knew what, what it was like at that time. But around the time that Medicare and Medicaid were, were being discussed and were entertained uh, uh, as, as, a, uh, as really the major transformation in American health care, uh, there was this old argument about what would happen to the doctor and patient relationship if there was the passage of Medicare and Medicaid. And you'll notice that this argument, um, which is that there was a good old time, and that doctors and patients were able to interact in a free way, unfettered, and then there would be suddenly government takeover with the passage of Medicare and Medicaid. This is basically the same exact argument that uh, was used around the time that the Affordable Care Act was discussed, and you'll, it, it, it's almost exactly the same argument that was used. Um, I know that we had, um, uh, the, the head of the AM, American Medical Association recently here, the AMA has certainly changed dramatically over the last 40 years, but the American Medical Association actually officially opposed the passage of Medicare. And their chief, chief spokesperson was Ronald Reagan. Um, and this came back to haunt Ronald Reagan when he ran for president in the, 19, in the, uh, in the late 70s. But Ronald Reagan in this, um, in this eloquent uh, uh, advertisement talks about how the passage of Medicare would ruin American medicine. He first, and then I provided some quotes from the, from the talk, but he talks about how um, basically how the patients would lose privacy uh, during, uh, if, there, if there was Medicare. Now in our country, under our free enterprise system, we have seen medicine reach the greatest heights that it has in any country in the world. The privacy, the care that is given to a person, the right to choose a doctor, the right to go from one doctor to another would you know, be basically destroyed by the passage of Medicare. 
And actually, the interesting thing, I think he was speaking, speaking for the AMA, he talked a lot about the loss of freedom for doctors. And in the second paragraph, he talks a lot about how doctors would not be allowed to, uh, to practice where they wanted, they wouldn't be able to choose the specialty that they wanted, that doctors would, they would lose their freedom with the passage of Medicare. Um, and of course, Reagan and the American Medical Association were largely wrong. Um, so you have to realize that they were talking around the time of the Cold War, and so there was a lot of sort of anti-socialist uh, themes in those prior comments. Um, government did end up playing a far larger role in medicine with the passage of Medicare and Medicaid. So those, for, those fears were certainly confirmed. But interestingly enough, almost everything else they were concerned about didn't happen at all. So for doctors, there were, there's basically at this time, and the, the time since Medicare passage, there's been no requirement to enter specific fields. There's no tracking of what happens to residents, um, uh, despite the fact that Medicare funds graduate medical education almost entirely. There's no regulation of where practices are located, and so we've had ongoing maldistribution of physicians uh, throughout the country for uh, decades. And we've actually now got more, uh, we got incredible, incredibly wide variation in income and reliance on public payers among different specialties in medicine. Um, so this is a description of, uh, of physician mean in incomes from 2004 by specialties. Um, and I mean, one of the points of this slide is to show that there is wide variation um, from the top among hemoc and orthopedic surgery to the lows of family practice and geriatrics in terms of mean income. But overall, none of these physicians are poor. They're all doing very, very well. So physicians, physician incomes over the last four decades have, have gone up, and physicians have done overall very well. What's interesting is where this income comes from, and um, there is considerable variation in terms of specialties and their reliance on public payers. And this, to some extent, plays a role in terms of why there's going to be a heterogeneous experience in, in terms of the patient-doctor relationship for, uh, by specialty. So um, the fields that rely the most, so uh, this is not explained, but this is the amount of money for um, outpatient income for a provider from Medicaid. The purple is money that comes from Medicare. This uh, lighter color is money that comes from private insurers, and this is money that comes from the, on the far right, is money that comes from out-of-pocket payments from patients. So not surprisingly, um, the, the physicians that rely the least on public payers are plastic surgeons, here with the largest amount of payment from, from out-of-pocket costs. And then it's also not surprising the fields um, that are more reliant on Medicare, which includes um, geriatrics and nephrology, which uh, you know uh, just happen happens to, to fit um, um, the, the you know care of the elderly. Not surprising that should be from Medicare and care of people with end-stage renal disease, which is um, uh, all paid for by Medicare. So. If anything, physicians have done very well since the passage of Medicare and Medicaid, and there's wide variation in terms of where they get their money from public payers. So what's happened to the um, actual encounter between the patients and the doctor? What's happened to the visit? And this has actually been the subject of a small line of research around visit time. Um, and this is um, uh, data that comes from the National Ambulatory Medical Care Survey, uh, an analysis done by Elmer Ab led by Elmer Abo. And what he did was he characterized what happened to the length of clinical visits and what happened during clinical visits. Um, doctors always complain that there's not enough time to do all the things that they want to do. Um, and uh, uh, an economist, David Mechanic, had reported earlier in the New England Journal that visit times have actually gone up and said, doctors, why are you complaining? There's nothing wrong. You're having more time to spend with your patients. And, we found that, in fact, that did happen, that visit times had gone up from 18 minutes in primary care to 21 minutes on average over time for primary care visits. But what happened was that the number of things addressed during the visit also went up at the same time, from 5.4 items addressed during the visit to up to 7.1, meaning that the general intensity of the, of the visit and the amount of content that was discussed during the visit had actually 
gone up, which is why doctors feel the pressure during encounters uh, to do more. So that's sort of the state of things since um, the passage of Medicare. Doctors have done reasonably well. They're under probably a little bit more pressure to deliver um, more medicine or uh, more medical content than they had in the past. So here I'm going to just summarize, attempt to summarize in a single slide how I envision the Affordable Care Act. Um, you can, uh, you know, the Affordable Care Act is a very, very long law. But these, I think, are the co these four components. I believe are the four uh, main uh, central areas of focus for the Affordable Care Act. Um, so first um, is private insurance market regulation, um, and so that includes things like uh, the inclusion of 26-year-olds on a family health insurance plan. Um, that includes things like the uh, inability to deny someone coverage because of um, uh, pre-existing conditions. It's uh, actually uh, insurance market regulation includes the changes in the medical loss ratio. So now insurers are required to spend the majority of their dollar on health care, not on profits, not on administration. Um, and I'll go into more detail on each of these areas. The second major component, which um, is not gotten that much attention, uh, but, but is a focus on cost containment. And this includes the creation of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. The University of Chicago is one of the few institutions in the country to actually have two innovation awards, um, uh, one led by uh, David Meltzer, and one le uh, led uh, by Stacey Lindau and uh, Dorian Miller and others um, involving Community Rx. And those are examples of experimentation in terms of healthcare financing that the Secretary of Health and Human Services can disseminate widely throughout CMS. And then I'm going to talk in more detail about two um, innovations in payment reform, um, uh, one called the Patient Centered Medical Home and one called the Accountable Care Organization. Um, and um, those have direct implications for, I think, the patient-doctor relationship. Um, the third is um, investment in the healthcare workforce. This is a, actually gets even less attention than the other areas of the Affordable Care Act. Um, um, many of you may not know this, but primary care doctors who, uh, who uh, receive Medicare payments have been actually getting a 10% bonus for being primary care doctors um, uh, throughout uh, the last few years. This includes things um, like um, shifting unused residency spots from one part of the country to another part of the country. Um, um, it, one of the reasons that it has received very little attention is that it's actually gotten very little money to, to do the things that it was supposed to do. And finally, the fourth component, which gets the most attention in the Affordable Care Act, is of course insurance coverage expansion. And it, uh, you certainly, in the last few months, heard a lot of, about the mess, messiness of creating the insurance exchanges. Um, you've heard a lot about um, the uh, irregularity in which Medicaid expansion has been occurring across the country. Um, and all of that has uh, potential to affect the uh, patient-doctor relationship. And just to remind you of why um, um, insurance coverage expansion uh, was part of the law is that we have this segment of the pie of the population, 16%, that remain uninsured um, around, um, third, around 50 million people in a population of 300 million people. Um, and then among this uninsured, these, uh, you can sort of describe the uninsured in terms of their, uh, their, their incomes. Um, these individuals um, are uh, in lighter blue, are, uh, are, are basically very, very poor, uh, but not yet poor enough to, be, uh, to meet eligibility for old Medicaid uh, require, uh, eligibility requirements. And these individuals um, have a little bit more money um, and are the ex individuals expected to buy health insurance on the insurance exchanges, uh, the state and federal exchanges. So, um, uh, I was telling Mark earlier that he, 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 he gave me one of the, probably the, one of the richest topics to tackle, but probably conceptually one of the most difficult to uh, think about. Um, but uh, here's my best attempt at thinking about how each of these four major components uh, could affect the patient-doctor relationship. So when I first thought about private insurance market regulation a couple of years ago, um, I, I, you know, I really uh, thought that it just should be a good thing. 
Um, you know, the overall intent of insurance market regulation is to make it easier for individuals to obtain and keep their insurance. And if that actually did, if that was the case, then patients should have better access to doctors and should maintain longer relationships with their doctors. Um, and that would be, in general, uh, very good for the patient-doctor relationship. But it's actually, of course, turned out to be more complicated in this. And unfortunately, it depends on specific circumstances uh, of the patient, what form of insurance they have, um, where, where they are in the country, what kind of doctor they're trying to see. So um, just to give you an example of how there's variability from provision to provision among this bucket of, uh, of insurance market regulation, uh, certainly allowing children to stay on a parent's plan up until the age of 26 years of age, that's a great thing. It helps affect young, young individuals who have no insurance, and it affects the core variable of access to doctors. So it makes access to doctors better, and that should have a positive effect overall. So, certainly banning the use of pre-existing conditions to deny coverage for health insurance, especially in the small individual marketplace for insurance, this is beneficial for individuals who are chronically ill who have no insurance and again should, be, should have a positive effect by making it easier to get access to doctors. Um, many in this audience um, are um, specialists who take care of individuals with very complex diseases like inflammatory bowel disease or complex cancers. Um, for those of you who take care of those patients, I think some of you may be aware that the ban on lifetime spending limits is particularly beneficial for this patient population. Um, uh, before I left for Washington, one of my patients was a, um, a woman in her 50s who had inflammatory bowel disease. It had about like 10 surgeries, I think, over her lifetime and was about to reach her uh, million dollar lifetime limit. Um, and she said, make sure that this doesn't get touched. Um, but so, you, so if you're a, a really chronically ill person who's been privately insured for years, seeing specialists, um, this part of the law should help you maintain your relationships with your specialists and be good for the patient-doctor relationship. Um, but you know, we've obviously this is far more complicated in the last couple of months. Um, uh, I think this is probably fits in the law, in the, uh, law of unintended consequences. Um, in the last couple of months, you've probably heard that several million people have lost their health insurance, which they purchased on their own on the, um, on the, in, in the small individual um, insurance marketplace. Um, and these are individuals who were, uh, many of them self-employed, who had bought a Kaiser plan, for example, in the Washington, D.C. area, and were suddenly told that that plan uh, was no longer existed. So what happened was part of insurance market regulation was uh, a requirement for all insurance to meet minimum standards. And what they did was they defined in the law something called essential health benefits. And if you read the essential health benefits, they seem quite basic. For example, the health plan should cover prescription drugs. It should cover inpatient hospitalizations, outpatient visits. But it included things also like um, uh, 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 obstetrics and gynecology, uh, family planning, preventive care. Um, for whatever reason, plans that were offered in the past didn't have all those 10 components. Um, and so because they don't meet the essential health benefit requirements, many of these plans were being canceled. And so because of that, these individuals with self-insurance um, basically be, uh, began to lose insurance and um, the Obama administration has unfortunately backed away from enforcing this and has allowed them to keep their insurance. Uh, but this has obviously caused an disru unintended disruption in patients maintaining their access to their doctor. And um, I started, started this section by saying that this, is, this turned out to be far more complicated uh, than I originally thought. Um, and, but, but, but you can think about it another way. If you put your, uh, yourself in the uh, shoes of an insurance, uh, insurance plan executive, you're basically being required to meet more uh, requirements. You're now required to spend your money in a certain way. Um, you're not, um, and, and so, and at the same time, you're trying to um, include, you know, be inclusive, um, have more people join your insurance plans, but also contain costs. So if you're an insurance executive, you're going to do things to try to control costs while you're being squeezed. And so one thing that will happen, or has happened already, is that the insurance plans that are being offered on the exchanges for individuals 
who have a little bit of income to spend on health insurance, they're going to basically try to control costs by um, restricting the network of doctors that a patient on these new insurance plans can go to. By controlling the uh, provider network, they can try to control costs. The other thing that will um, also potentially have, or potentially has already happened, is that because insurers feel squeezed, they may pass on their costs to um, individuals and uh, employers and patients. Um, and so premiums may also go higher uh, because of these, these changes in the insurance market regulation. It's also important to, uh, I think, say a few words on what's also happening in the, the world of employer-based insurance. I, in the prior um, pie chart I showed you, the vast majority of the country is still in private, uh, private employer-sponsored um, insurance. Um, um, and you've probably heard in the news that large companies like Sears and Walgreens and other corporations in the Chicago area have actually started to, started to change their behavior. Um, for example, now employees of Walgreens are expected to purchase their insurance um, um, through private exchanges. Um, and over the last decade, we'd also seen uh, shifts of costs from employers to employees, so that you'll notice that deductibles have been becoming higher. Um, cost shifting to patient to employees has been happening for at least a decade. Um, so I, it, it's not entirely clear that the Affordable Care Act is the direct cause of these changes uh, that employers have undertaken, but it, um, and you, it's certainly fair to ask would these disruptions have occurred anyways, but the Affordable Care Act certainly has done something to uh, seemingly seemed, uh, has seemingly accelerated changes um, in the way that um, everyone has behaved with regards to health insurance, uh, for better or worse. Um, so let me shift the gears from insurance market regulation, which I thought was simple, but is actually more complicated, to something that was already complicated to begin with and is uh, now more complicated, which is uh, efforts to contain costs. Um, so if we uh, attempted, on this grid, what I've done is I've, I've basically shown you a continuum of, of different ways that we could contain healthcare costs. We could try to contain costs through the traditional fee-for-service system. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum are bundled payments or global payments. And you've seen other speakers in the prior talks talk about this continuum of change in the way we pay for health care. In the middle are intermediate mechanisms, um, including penalties, incentives, the creation of a medical home, um, and creation of uh, accountable care organizations. It's clear that if you try to contain costs by simply changing the uh, traditional fee-for-service system, you basically um, cause, you basically uh, cause damage to the patient-doctor relationship because uh, uh, doctors and hospitals, sensibly enough, want to maintain revenue and income. And so if you low, simply do things like uh, lower fees for services as a way of cost containment, doctors and, patient, doctors and hospitals behave in ways to compensate. Um, so the traditional way for a doctor, if, if a, visit, uh, a fee for a visit goes down, they're basically going to just increase the volume to compensate and maintain income. Um, and um, uh, uh, over the last uh, year, I've had the uh, opportunity to visit um, um, doctors in China and in Korea who provide diabetes care. And in, um, in Korea, they see 60 patients in the afternoon. Um, and in China, they see 80 patients with diabetes in the afternoon. And that is the product of the fee-for-service system in those countries, that the, 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 the payment is so low that the volume has to be compensated. Um, and actually, that's not too crazy, that's not too far off from behavior of some doctors in the United States. I have a, um, I'm going to use my, uh, my, I have a lot of cousins who practice medicine. I have a cousin who does pediatrics in the suburbs. 60 children a day is not unusual. Um, uh, that's a lot of patients. Um, and that probably doesn't lead to a good patient-doctor relationship. Um, whether or not things like bundled payments um, lead to better doctor-patient relationships is not entirely clear, but certainly better coordination among doctors for complex patients, better coordination of services could be beneficial. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, the most prevalently, uh, most commonly discussed um, models, which are those intermediate models the medical home and the ACO, and how they might affect the doc patient-doctor relationship. In general, um, they have a lot of common themes that should be beneficial to, the, to um, the way we interact with patients. 
So one common theme is that they, they want more continuity of care over time and place. Um, they, want the pa they want the doctor in particular to think about um, how their um, interactions with the patient uh, could lead to changes to hospitalizations, ER visits, and they want the, the doctor to be some, somewhat over, uh, um, o an overseer of all those activities. So doctors and patients, doctors and providers are the focus of the, uh, of the effort to incentivize change. And um, most of the new payment models require uh, that doctors and, and healthcare providers and hospitals meet some minimum standards of quality of care. So these are sort of common themes of these new models. In the patient-centered medical home, which has been around for at least over a decade, and is very popular among um, employers, including IBM, many uh, private payers are involved in medical home experiments, and, the, and certainly Medicare and Medicaid are very high on the medical home. Typically, the, the, the financial mechanism is very simple. Uh, doctors who practice in a medical home that meets minimum requirements um, um, get paid a $15 to $20 per member per month uh, fee on top of routine fee-for-service medicine. Uh, and the medical home I could summarize in, in one phrase would be it's a proactive, comprehensive form of primary care. It's the kind of primary care that I think all of us would want. Um, wouldn't it be great if your doctor reminded you of um, upcoming preventive services that were needed rather than sort of waiting to see you in, uh, at a visit? Uh, wouldn't it be great to be able to see your doctor um, after hours or on the weekends when it was convenient for you? Wouldn't it be great to interact with your doctor um, through, um, through a web portal um, for simple questions that could be addressed through those mechanisms. So it's, it's a kind of proactive primary care that we all would want. I think the only problem with the medical home is it's, it's not entirely clear to me this will actually save money. Um, uh, uh, in, in one demonstration project that was done at the Group Health Cooperative, it did improve diabetes care pretty dramatically and did lower costs within an existing um, HMO network. Um, uh, but whether or not that can be proven to be the case in other settings is not clear. So overall, I mean, all these things should, um, should make patients happier, should make doctors happier. Uh, you know, expanded hours um, with better access, um, electronic patient portals, and then um, it includes many elements of quality improvement, including chronic disease management programs, which hopefully will lead to a more activated patient at the time that a, a doctor needs a patient. So all these things I think should have a positive effect on the patient-doctor relationship. Now, um, in prior talks, you've heard a lot about, uh, you've heard something about the, the, the accountable care organizations, and um, uh, I worked specifically on this, this uh, on the Medicare ACO as it was being rolled out, um, and it's part of the Affordable Care Act, um, and it's um, essentially in very early days where some of the first uh, performance, the, some of the earliest ACOs uh, didn't get started until the start of uh, 2012, to the, the end of 2012. Um, and it's part of a multi-component uh, effort to link accountability to payment. And there's two, at least two forms of, um, um, multiple forms of the ACO. One is tr the traditional Medicare ACO, but there were also um, in the sites that were um, labeled the pioneer ACOs who were um, asked to meet even st more stringent standards than traditional Medicare ACOs. And private insurers like Blue Cross Blue Shield have now also created uh, accountable care organizations. Uh, you may have heard that, for example, the Advocate Healthcare System entered into an ACO um, agreement with uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, and, and so the, um, um, and I think throughout the country, there are about 200 uh, federally sponsored um, ACOs. So what does, what does an ACO do? So it's, a, it's basically try, uh, a voluntary group of physicians and hospitals and other healthcare providers, so it's an army of the willing, uh, that are uh, asked to assume responsibility for care of a defined population of Medicare beneficiaries. Uh, for the Medicare ACO, they're asked to care for at least 5,000 Medicare beneficiaries. They're supposed to uh, meet high quality standards of care, um, but also reduce costs of care. Um, uh, and if they're able to reduce costs of care, they're sharing the savings with Medicare. So you can sort of see that, um, um, that it's a very um, 
uh, sort of a difficult concept to wrap your heads around because uh, if you're a hospital, why would you ever want to try to save money? Uh, you know, why would you want to you know, try to reduce your revenue uh, from a payer purposely? Um, and um, it's interesting to see what's happened with ACOs over time. There's some regions of the country where there's, uh, any hospital you go to is part of an ACO or multiple ACOs. Um, most people recognize that Massachusetts is ACO land. Um, so why are some of these hospitals going out of their way to become ACOs? Uh, many of them basically believe that it's preparing them for the, the world of bundled payments. They're trying, they, they see that, um, that, that reimbursement is going to be uh, lower in the future and they want to be able to um, uh, deliver care in that kind of system and they feel like the ACO prepares them for this. Um, um, in other cases, I think some of the leaders of these organizations just want to, they, they want to be at the head of things. They want to uh, be part of experimentation as it occurs. So the ACO and the patient-doctor relationship, it's not as clear as the medical home in terms of what it will do to the patient-doctor relationship. Um, it certainly will be beneficial in terms of increasing collaboration between healthcare organizations. Wouldn't it be great if you knew that your, your, your patient who was in the DCAM suddenly popped up at, North, at Northwestern's ER for some unclear reason and you were able to address that need um, um, before or soon after the, effect, after the fact. Um, population management in general uh, would be also excellent in terms of um, uh, being able to identify individuals who have missed preventive services, who need to come in, who are just for some reason lost to follow up. Um, and I think one of the, 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 the principal part of the, uh, the accountable care organization, though, that sort of makes the patient-doctor relationship potentially um, problematic is that it does focus almost entirely on re reduction in healthcare costs. And there will be times, in me and there will be medical decisions where the patient and the doctor will have different uh, ideas about what they want to do. Um, and um, it's, it's not necessarily pleasant also for a patient to suddenly receive a call from an external body that's not the doctor about, about services they've received at another facility. So there's sort of this uh, challenge, which is that the doctor and population manager and, over, and payer are all sort of being confused. And, um, and I think when that happens, uh, the patients have potentially conflicting relationships with their doctors. So I, I will spend very little on the healthcare workforce investment, although in the subsequent slides I'm going to talk a lot about uh, the physician workforce. Um, in the short term, because the investment in this has been so small, and also because of the nature in which it takes, um, uh, doctors are like trees, it takes a very long time for them to grow, um, it's very unlikely that any of this investment will lead to um, short-term changes in the patient-doctor relationship. However, uh, long-term, uh, the workforce investment will be beneficial, I think. It, uh, uh, he national healthcare policymakers, um, for better or worse, love primary care. And uh, areas of the country that have a large numbers of, uh, have a fairly high density of primary care doctors to population have, in general, better health, lower costs. And so I think, in general, having better access to primary care will be beneficial. Um, there's an interest in training doctors to work with other disciplines, pharmacists, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, um, therapists. In general, that should, be, that should lead to a better form of medicine. Um, and there are uh, potential changes to graduate medical education that are being considered, um, ensuring that we train people to be able to work with electronic medical records. Doctors of the future are going to have to be able to analyze data in ways that um, um, older doctors did not have to. Um, so moving on to probably the, the big kahuna of the Affordable Care Act, which is insurance coverage expansion. Um, so the original estimates that most people use, which, is, um, which was based on the idea that all states would adopt Medicaid expansion, was that there would be 30 million people by 2014 or 2015 who would be newly insured because of the Affordable Care Act. And that's uh, not going to happen because of the uh, Supreme Court decision on Medicaid. And so I, I'm going to lower that to around 20 million. So there are going to be all these, uh, that are, and actually there already are, um, several million newly insured individuals 
um, um, now, uh, now in the healthcare system, but the number of doctors and the healthcare providers that are in existence um, are not going to expand at the same rate. When, um, and basically in the country there are around 210, 220,000 primary care doctors, for example. And that number is largely static, is not gonna, it has not changed. And you have this sudden um, um, inflow of around, you know, let's say 20 million people. So it's, it's not only a, a patient, and um, it's not only a supply and demand problem, but it's basically whether or not doctors will accept the new forms of insurance or the kinds of insurance that the newly insured have. In particular, there's a lot of concern about the Medicaid population. Where are they gonna go? Um, where are they gonna get their care um, now that they have insurance? Having insurance is only, only gets you part way to um, having access to health care. So um, in a couple of different national studies that were done uh, based on the 30 million estimate, um, it's actually kind of surprising. Most of these estimates, uh, most of these studies have found that the actual um, um, imbalance in supply and demand uh, would actually not be that large. Uh, we live in a country of 300 million people. We're talking about adding 20 million more people uh, with health insurance, and many of these people are actually not sick. Um, and so, um, uh, most of the analyses have accounted for, oh, the other thing to note is that many of the uninsured are already getting health care right now. It's not like we're going from zero to 60. Uh, they're getting some care, probably not as much care as they need, and so the actual uh, change in demand for services may not be as large as people would imagine. So most uh, national estimates say that we need about 2% more primary care doctors than we did um, uh, before the Affordable Care Act. Um, and, and it amounts to about four to 7,000 more doctors, um, um, uh, primary care doctors, to meet that demand. And just to give you another set of uh, idea, context for what that number means, we produce around um, 7,000 new, um, I think, do, uh, internal, mezzanine, internal mezzanine resident physicians per year. That's, a, that's about what we produce per year. Um, so the, de, uh, um, the, the challenge, so the 2%, the 7,000 doesn't seem actually that daunting. It's actually not that bad. Um, the problem uh, in this analysis that we, I did when I was in government is that the actual distribution of where the uninsured, the newly insured are, and where providers are is not uh, distributed. They're, they don't, they're not lined up. They're not matched up. And so um, we undertook this analysis where we looked at the imbalance of supply and demand by states and then by small areas sort of viewed through the lens of a city. Um, and so if you take that 7,000 and you look at it from the perspective of states, you'll see that, um, and this is assuming that all states under, undertake expansion, um, insurance coverage expansion equally, um, um, you'll see that it's very, un the, the actual additional need for doctors is, um, is not the same from, from state to state. Um, and that's because uh, some states start with high levels of uninsurance. Some states start with high levels of primary care provider supply. And so the, 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 the areas where there is complete imbalance is where we really have problems. Um, and the blue states are states that um, have very low expected surge in, in, in demand for primary care doctors. In these states, you don't, these numbers represent percentage of the original baseline supply. Um, at most would need 1%, 1.3% in some of these uh, northeastern and upper Midwest states. The red states, um, as, and this has, been repeat, this has been said before in prior talks in the series, um, these states which have happened to also uh, decline to expand Medicaid, um, uh, in particular Texas, has this incredibly large uninsured population but also has a low primary care um, um, then pr uh, primary care provider density, and so has a, um, a need for primary care providers of 5% of the baseline supply. California is also in uh, potential trouble uh, with uh, around 3% uh, need. Um, so it varies by state, and, and some of the states, maybe with some, uh, maybe they had a crystal ball and they knew that um, this was coming, and so that, that's why they declined to expand coverage, but it, it, it's, it's completely variable by state. But even within a city, uh, it's also variable, and so this, this uh, may be a familiar map to those of you in the audience. Um, it's a map of Chicago, of course, 
And uh, the darker colored areas, or primary care service areas, are ones that have the highest um, expected need for primary care providers uh, in the city. And it's not surprising that this area in the far west, in the west, and the, this area in the southeast, um, southwest, um, have some of the highest needs for more doctors. Um, in this particular neighborhood here, um, uh, I, I think the numbers are they have about they have 40 primary care providers, but they have a 10% need for more doctors. In other words, they need four more doctors in that neighborhood in order to uh, meet expected surge in, in demand for more, uh, uh, more primary care. So um, I, I don't, I'll talk a little bit about the organ experiment, but uh, the Massachusetts experiment uh, experience um, is quite also, is, is also very informative. Um, and um, what, interestingly, uh, what's, uh, there are a lot of stories about how uh, the initial, um, uh, pa uh, with the initial passage of Romney care, that there were a lot of, uh, there was an increase in visits to the emergency rooms by the newly insured, and that there were long wait times to get in to see a doctor. And that, that certainly was the case. Um, more, and I, I, what I would um, tell you is that we need to be a little bit patient with um, all forms of healthcare reform, including the Affordable Care Act. Um, so in a more recent survey with, uh, pr with doctors in Massachusetts, um, actually 70% of them support um, um, Massachusetts health reform, and there's no difference in uh, favorable opinions by primary care or non-primary care. Um, about 24% of doctors said that wait times actually got worse with Massachusetts health reform, but 60% said that there was no change. And this is after several years of Massachusetts health reform being in place. So that initial year of surge um, may be disruptive, but over time, uh, this data suggests that things calm down um, once the newly insured are sort of incorporated into the system. And this is illustrated by um, patient wait times in recent Massachusetts uh, physician surveys where there's really not much change in physician wait times to see a, a new patient uh, by specialty. It, I mean, it's not great, but uh, it's basically hovering around 50 days to get in to see a primary care doctor in internal medicine. Um, for whatever reason, it's really easy to see an orthopedic surgeon. <laughs> so, um, and I, just a comment about mass, uh, the organ experiment. Um, so recently, last week, you may have noticed that the organ experiment um, which uh, was the Medicaid experiment where some patients, individuals were randomized to early enrollment in Medicaid and others were not. And in early years, basically financial ruin was lower among people with Medicaid. They were less depressed um, and um, uh, they got more diabetes care. Actual measures of diabetes care did not change within a short time frame. Last week, they published an article in Science showing that ER visits certainly rose with Medicaid expansion um, um, among those who got Medicaid earlier. Basically, all forms of health services rose in um, people getting Medicaid earlier in, in Oregon, um, which is, I think, somewhat similar to what happened in, um, in Massachusetts. Whether or not that remains the case over time, I think, is the question. So historically, government programs have not. And I've, I hope I've proven that to you uh, with, uh, with how well doctors have, been, have done over the years. Um, government programs have not fundamentally undermined the patient-doctor relationship in America. Doctors have not been negatively affected by Medicare, Medicaid. In fact, they have benefited. Um, in Massachusetts, health reform has to support a majority of paid physicians, and wait times to see a doctor are basically stable now in Massachusetts over, the, over, to, uh, over uh, now at year, um, year nine. Um, the quality of patient-doctor relationships is determined by core variables that are more important determinants of patient-doctor relationships than health reform itself. Um, I think that things like population, ex the expectations of different generations, um, lifestyle expectations of young doctors versus older doctors and technological changes and shifts um, have actually had a bigger, will have a bigger effect on the patient-doctor relationship than health reform itself. The Affordable Care Act will have heterogeneous effects on the patient-doctor relationship depending on what kind of insurance you have, what your health status is, the physician's specialty you're in, where the doctor practices, and 
probably more importantly, where in the country you're seeking care. So the challenges for clinicians is that medicine cannot be practiced without considering cost of care or efficiency anymore. You have to be, we all have to become more knowledgeable about insurance, coverage, payments, and, and, other, and the health system in general to help our patients. I mean, we don't have to be as good as a social worker, but we gotta be, we gotta be able to communicate with the social worker. And how will you respond to these new incentives and penalties and new forms of payments? Are you going to accept the newly insured? These are questions for any physician or healthcare organization. I think there's a profound challenge for medical educators, uh, which is how do we continue to successfully recruit these young people with the ideal characteristics for patient-doctor relationships in this changing time? And should we really consider alternative characteristics to the MCAT scores or GPAs? I mean, I know that those are important. Um, I was selected in, into medical school with that old system, but what about you know, commitment to a community or um, uh, things like that? Um, some medical schools have considered that as criteria for entry into medicine. Should we train students, to, how do we train students to react when involving healthcare system and inv innovations in healthcare s practice, and how do we do that if there are more strings attached to funding for training programs? So I'm going to end on, with uh, a last piece of data, um, which is um, uh, the Affordable Care Act doctors and patients. So it turns out, who, did, who do the patients really trust to talk about the Affordable Care Act? Believe it or not, it's us. So these are the percentage of patients who would trust information from a doctor or nurse about the Affordable Care Act. And they trust us above uh, everyone else, particularly uh, uh, anyone else down here. Um, <laughs> on the other hand, um, where have they gotten their information? They're not getting information from us. They're getting information from the news media, who they trust the least. This doesn't make any sense. Um, but uh, we have a role to play in explaining uh, the health system to our patients and helping them navigate uh, all the changes that have happened. So um, we're the most trusted voice in a rapidly changing system. We have a foot in the patient world. Um, I think we're respected by policymakers most of the time. And so that's an opportunity to, to lead the system through a period of transformation. Um, I think one that we probably haven't taken up enough. Thank you very much. Dr. Wang's talk is open for questions, comments. Thank you very much. That's a great question. So the question is, how do we identify basically high quality care or high value care in medicine. And um, I think this actually gets to the, the problems that we're having and have actually chronically had with measuring quality of care, performance, the, most of the performance measures that we're using, I can, I can guarantee you they're, they're terrible. Um, and they, they either under, uh, they under measure uh, quality of care that we provide or completely miss the boat actually. Um, and actually, academic medical centers in particular, I think, struggle with this because we, we, we certainly know that our doctors are quite smart, um, but how do you measure um, the smart diagnostician? How do you uh, measure the, you know, the more efficient workup than the, the sloppy workup, and those sort of things? And um, I think there are some ways. Um, focusing on patient reported outcomes may be one way, one avenue to doing this. And so there's great interest at Medicare, for example, in actual me measuring patient functional outcomes rather than relying on performance measures that are based on medical records. You. Doctors are the most trusted source of information on the Affordable Care Act, but doctors are also, in general, quite uh, uncertain about what this what the specifics actually are, and they will be asked by patients all sorts of complicated questions that they may not really answer to. How can doctors increase their sophistication so that they're actually in a good position to assist their patients in dealing with and navigating the practical challenges that health reform is going to throw up for them? <laughs> Another. Um, that's a great question. So, how do we? How do we? How do we actually? Um, serve patients uh, by helping them, exp helping them to understand the Affordable Care Act when the doctors themselves don't understand the Affordable Care Act. And on top of that, uh, I think the, uh, the physician population is pretty conflicted about um, how they feel about the Affordable Care Act. Um, I think there are several physicians actually in Congress, um, most of them um, 
pretty opposed to the Affordable Care Act. So if you're opposed to something, you're not going to try to learn it. Um, but in any case, um, I, I don't know exactly the right answer. It's sort of the same educational problem that we have with young people as well. Where do we squeeze that in? Uh, you know, for a working physician um, pra already practicing, CME doesn't work very well in terms of conveying information about cl changes in clinical practice. Um, and how do we educate people? Uh, maybe it's through CME or other avenues. Um, I think some of the physician organizations, like the American College of Physicians, has tried to create summary articles about the Affordable Care Act for practicing doctors um, that could be a source of material for education. But it's, it's, it's definitely a, it's a challenge at every level of, of training and, of, uh, and the career of a doctor. But, but I, I had never seen the subject laid out as clearly as you did this afternoon. I, I don't mean this as false praise, but it's true. But those what do I owe you? The four elements of, of the Affordable Care Act you often see one of them covered by the media, which is the expansion of coverage, right. and leaving the other three alone. Right. It, 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 it's certainly a challenging law to um, summarize and to digest. And um, I, honestly, uh, it took me a year in Washington to really understand what was going on. And I, I mean, there's always new things that, I, that, that pop up because the law was so dense. Great question. And, and you described very eloquently, I, I think, what I was trying to convey in a messy way, which is that um, when, when, the, when the doctor is also the, uh, is controlling the purse strings as well, it creates conflicts uh, with the, uh, in the patient-doctor relationship. Um, so thus far, I, I think it's still too early to know um, what has happened with the uh, initial 200 um, ACO so far. If you, uh, I mean, through the grapevine, you hear that um, leaders, leadership in these ACOs are banging their heads against the wall to try to figure out how to contain costs. It's a very uh, challenging question. Uh, um, the, uh, from our re meeting with the advocate um, CM, chief medical officer this summer, we know that uh, the typical things they've tried are uh, trying to reduce variation in practice, uh, which does come down to the interaction between a patient and a doctor, but they focus mainly on uh, standardization of procedures in, the, in the, the operating room as a way of containing costs, um, um, changing the way that they purchase supplies. Um, so it's not come down to the individual patient-doctor interaction in the visit yet, but um, um, it wouldn't surprise me if, that, if, they, if they found an outlier in terms of healthcare costs that they would go after that. I was surprised at the small number of primary care physicians who were needed uh, to meet the, what would the anticipated demand. Uh, would, would not increasing, let's say, for our medical graduates or Caribbean medical graduates be one solution to that uh, over a short period of time? Oh, that's interesting. So um, as you know, the United States um, medical school system, and hopefully there's an educator in the audience who can correct my uh, errors that I make in, in my statements, but uh, there is going to be a uh, opening of, of uh, I think, uh, uh, many uh, new American medical schools in the coming decade, and um, um, and that this is because of expectations that there's going to be a long-term shortage of physicians in the United States. Um, um, though those new American medical graduates will likely fill uh, graduate medical spots that are actually occupied currently by foreign medical graduates. Correct. They'll actually push the foreign medical graduates likely out. Um, so that means that the, uh, the, 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 the barrier to what you're talking about is actually the number of residency spots um, in, the, in the United States. Um, and I don't see, I don't know if, the, um, if there's any possibility of expansion of the number of GME uh, spots in the United States. Um, so the answer is that is not likely to be a solution. The other solution that policymakers really love is the idea that there will be suddenly a flood of physician assistants and NPs. As you can imagine, a single primary care physician working with an army of 10 NPs or PAs as a way of, I hate the word, but uh, extending the effect of that doctor. Um, and so in some of these medical home experiments, they have teams uh, where there's a relatively small number of doctors, but many extenders or mid-levels um, who can provide care um, for, for, for uh, basic conditions. Thank you. Please. I 
just to comment to the question. Um, if the private insurance regulation component of the ACA was sort of intended to preserve the patient-doctor relationship or increase access, prolong access, it seems to me that it will never achieve that if it preserves employer-based health insurance since the average individual changes jobs every 18 months and therefore insurance plans, not to mention uh, you don't have any control over who your uh, insurance options are going to be from your employer. So I think it will never achieve that goal uh, until uh, while employer-based health insurance is, is in place. And I guess my other comment is just a question if you could speculate on how uh, if we had adopted a single payer system that would have impacted the doctor-patient relationship. Uh, well, you're, cer you're certainly right that um, when I talk about improvements or in changes to uh, improve access or to improve longevity of relationships, um, it's, uh, it's the incremental difference from the baseline. And um, the baseline will continue to be there, which is that uh, the, you know, people sh switch jobs, they switch insurance, um, and, that, and the law does not, does not um, help, uh, rect does not uh, eliminate that, that experience. Um, I, I mean, um, certainly it would be um, phenomenally easier to implement, and, um, and I do think it would, it would probably be beneficial to um, long-term relationships if, if we did have you know, a simplified form of insurance in the United States. Uh, politically, that was never going to happen. It's not going to happen. Um, um, and, um, but, but, so anyways, yeah, I, 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 I would love to live in that world, but uh, uh, we don't. We will take one or two more questions. Um. Hi, thanks for being here. Um, as insurance companies try to become more competitive and reduce the cost of their premiums, and there's an increase in patient co-pays, co-insurance, um, does it take the doctor out of the hot seat a little bit in the relationship to say, we have these two courses of treatment, this one is gonna cost you X amount in terms of your contribution, this one is gonna cost you Y? How does that change the relationship? That's a great question. Uh, so the, the, the shift of cost to um, employees uh, or the shift to um, uh, beneficiaries of uh, uh, bearing the cost of health care actually does have a, um, I think it has this, this un unintended beneficial effect of basically making it uh, uh, not forbidden to speak about health care costs. Um, and, um, it, it, and, it, and, and I think um, um, that may make it easier for doctors to talk about these things. You know, it's interesting, when you talk to doctors who work in safety net practices, um, they're used to talking about money all the time. Everything, all decisions are made with cost consciousness. Um, and, um, and, and actually it's possible that if we all practice medicine in that way, that the cost of healthcare wouldn't be that as high as they are. So yeah, I think there's some, um, one thing you notice that the ACO in the medical home, there's a lot of reliance on providers and doctors to make changes. Um, and, so, and one of the complaints that you get here from the doctor community is that there wasn't enough uh, um, movement to push, uh, the, uh, put, push, put the pressure on the population, on p patients, uh, because ultimately they, um, you know, they, they play a role. In, in, and so um, you know, we're all patients and you know. We're, uh, we're all patients at one point or another, and um, yeah, I think I think that that shift is not necessarily a bad thing. Hi. Um, so yesterday was our first day of the doctor-patient relationship course, which, uh, which some of the ethics follows, and I uh, got to moderate. And uh, in a couple of the classes, it seems the first-year medical students brought up. Um, in their discussion of you know, the doctor-patient relationship, they have already brought up uh, the issue of being concerned about being sued and how being a good doctor you know, sort of equated to uh, not getting sued or you know, sort of avoiding that. And um, it made me a little sad that you know, so early in their, uh, in their education, they're already sort of concerned about this. So I'm wondering um, where you think, you know, with the ACA, what's the future? <coughs> 
um, sort of the impact of these medical legal issues affecting how we practice and how we interact with our patients. Right. Um, so I, I, I'm certainly no expert in, in tort reform. Um, so I'll, um, you know, the standard line is that, um, um, that, that malpractice and, and response to mal the threat of malpractice only explains a fairly small fraction of, of, of excessive health care costs. Uh, tort reform is not, in, is, is not part of the Affordable Care Act. It's certainly very, it's very politicized, very popular among Republicans, um, um, not popular among Democrats um, who I think um, um, uh, receive donations from, from, from lawyers. Um, and, <laughs> But uh, but it is it I I, I don't know that that is a um, um, that's certainly something that certainly could be addressed but um, uh, it's certainly it's not part of the Affordable Care Act itself but if people have talked about maybe this will be the next wave of um, of, of trying to address the healthcare system interestingly enough you know tort reform one of the arguments for tort reform is to contain healthcare costs and but and so there is this curious phenomenon that has occurred, which is that healthcare costs have actually not risen as much in the last uh, few years. Um, it's quite dramatic. Um, and it's not due to tort reform didn't happen. It's probably too early for the Affordable Care Act to take credit. Um, if that was the reason for tort reform, then it may go, you know, it may go away. Sure. Thank you. Thank you.